Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. It's one of the most dangerous aircraft most pilots will ever fly, but for 70 years, it has served as the backbone of the U.S. spy machine. In the early days of the Cold War, Lockheed Martin set about creating a surveillance aircraft that could fly higher and further than any other. The U-2 Dragon Lady. But because this plane can reach altitudes of 80,000 feet, pilots and ground crews must undertake some serious preparations. In order to escape enemy sensors, missiles, and other defenses, the U-2 must fly at the very edge of space. To operate at such altitudes, pilots must undergo an intense preparation process, both physically and mentally. So last night had uh, steak and eggs about 17. For this reason, their mission begins hours before they actually enter the aircraft. U-2 pilots not only alter their diets, but wear specialized heavy flight suits. Once they are suited up, Attendants will provide them with several layers of gloves to protect them from the frigid temperatures. The specially designed helmets give the pilots access to oxygen, which they can breathe for at least one hour to rid their bodies of nitrogen, which can cause decompression sickness at high altitudes. Even before World War II, pilots and engineers knew that the human body simply could not function beyond certain altitudes. The combination of extreme cold, lack of oxygen, and decompression sickness meant crews needed to wear some sort of protection. Alright, let me know when it's good. Alright, they're going up on tail. What started as simple oxygen masks eventually started incorporating designs from the ongoing space program. Yes, sir, you... In fact, the modern U-2 pressure suit is a direct descendant of those worn by the Apollo astronauts. Though the suits are life-saving, they are also cumbersome. Because of their limited movement, pilots need assistance from several ground crew members throughout the pre-flight process. After the oxygenation process, pilots are driven to their aircraft, carrying a suitcase of oxygen the entire time. Their ground crews then lead them to their plane, helping them enter the U-2's tight cockpit. After being strapped in, the oxygen suitcase is removed and the pilot is plugged into the onboard oxygen system. Ground crews then perform their final checks before sealing the canopy. He is now ready to undergo one of the most demanding flights a pilot can encounter. The U-2 was designed for long distance flight. As such, 
The engineers gave it long, glider-like wings that are more than 40 feet longer than the fuselage. To further reduce weight, the U-2 does not have standard landing gear. Instead, it relies on a bicycle-style tire configuration, with a single wheel in front and another at the rear. For stability, temporary pogo gears are attached under the wings to support the aircraft during taxiing and takeoff. to maximize safety during takeoff. A designated chase car follows the U-2 down the runway, providing real-time instructions to the pilot to ensure he can take off safely. Though the U-2 is rated for 70,000 feet or 13 miles, it's estimated that it can reach about 80,000 feet in certain situations. This is high enough to reveal the curvature of the planet and provide the pilot with glimpses into space. From this vantage point, the U-2 is not only safe from most countermeasures, but it can collect valuable intelligence from all around the world. Landing the U-2 is often described as the hardest part of the mission. Because of its lightweight construction, the aircraft is difficult to control at low altitudes. Again, a chase car is used to provide the pilot with information about his altitude and angle. Once on the ground, the plane's massive wings caused it to tip over. The pogos must then be reattached in order to allow it to taxi back to the hangar. The reason why pilots, ground crews, and the Air Force itself are willing to go through the trouble of operating the U-2 is because it provides incredible reconnaissance results. One of its most powerful tools is the optical bar camera, a long focal optical device used to capture panoramic images from high altitudes. The camera on board the U-2 is capable of producing high-resolution photographs of landscapes, cities, and military installations in a single pass. Aside from the engine, the OBC is one of the largest and heaviest components of the U-2. Over the years, it has played a pivotal role in intelligence gathering for decades, particularly in monitoring enemy installations and tracking troop movements. It has also had non-military uses, such as acquiring scientific research, gathering atmospheric data, and tracking environmental changes. Art Beale Air Force Base in California, 9th Intelligence Squadron, has specialized aerial imagery production technicians who work with the footage captured from the U-2's OBC. Once a mission is complete, the real work begins on the ground.
the massive negatives captured by the U2's cameras had to undergo meticulous processing. With technicians working to enhance details and attempt to identify key intelligence data. The resulting images are printed and scrutinized, with specialists searching for the smallest anomalies that might indicate things like missile silos, aircraft movements, or hidden bunkers. This painstaking process provides the U.S. military and intelligence agencies with critical insights that can shape global policy during both war and peacetime. Despite its delicate appearance, the U-2 is a workhorse, with many of the aircraft having undergone thousands of mission hours. Like the pilots who fly them, the Dragon Ladies are put under significant strain due to the high altitudes at which they operate. For this reason, they must undergo regular disassembly for maintenance and upgrades. Disassembling a U-2 requires specialized technicians who understand the aircraft's unique design. Because of Lockheed Martin's focus on reducing weight, the plane has a more modular design than others, allowing the engine to be removed from the fuselage in a single piece. This gives technicians easy access to inspect the components for wear and tear. During this process, the entire plane is stripped down, tested, and reassembled to ensure it remains mission ready for the next flight. Any components that fail testing will either be replaced or rebuilt. At the heart of the U-2 is its General Electric F-118G-101 turbofan engine. This powerful yet efficient system is designed to keep the aircraft soaring at high altitudes, putting out a total of 17,000 pounds of thrust. Unlike other spy planes like the SR-71, the U-2 was never designed to be supersonic. Instead, engineers wanted it to be able to stay in the air for as long as possible. Testing is an integral part of keeping these engines running smoothly. During this process, technicians will put the engine inside a hothouse and run it at various power levels, monitoring for inconsistencies, leaks, or mechanical issues. At seven decades old, the U-2 Dragon Lady remains an integral part of the U.S. spy apparatus. Pretty cool stuff right there. Most of the aircraft's success is owed to the maintainers, who ensure that every component is regularly examined, tested, and replaced. I think it says the VNS-140, you would just double check for me. These men and women know the important role that the U-2 plays and will continue to play for several more decades. With their hard work and expertise, 
the Dragon Ladies of the U.S. Air Force will continue to fly high. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.